We'll let everybody continue to eat their lunch if they haven't had a chance to do that. But uh, thanks for taking part of your day to come and learn a little bit more about eThink, or what we like to call as Moodle by eThink. Um, we are a Moodle partner. Um, so uh, again, we're an organization that focuses on the support of Moodle. We are a Baltimore-based uh, organization. So don't hold that against no. <laughs> Uh, East Coast, I shared with folks myself if there's any points for that. I may, uh, I was born in Beatrice many years, many years ago now. And, um, uh, I'm a Minnesota based, Courtney is based in uh, Dallas Fort Worth area. So you know, we're an organization that uh, is primarily US based. So all the support, that question came earlier, we're not outsourcing any of our support. To, any other locations, we're all uh, providing support. You will see Courtney as a representative of our services organization. She's our VP of services. Uh, she has about 10 years of experience with Moodle. Um, and we have a group of folks that just is uh, a very talented organization. Moodle is, is all we support. So we're not the company that has to write and code Moodle or anything like that. We're all about support. And we hope to show you that our reputation is, is one that can take Moodle and everything you know about Moodle today and say we think there are ways that we can refresh that and enhance it and help you take that to the next level so that everything you already know, you don't have to relearn on another system or, or anything like that. But we know you're, you're making evaluations, making some uh, pretty important decisions. Um, and we take a look at it. What we thought we would use this session for is uh, we've got 60 or the next 60 minutes to kind of do an overview of some of the types of things that we enable with Moodle. And then um, uh, if there's any questions and answers, we'll stay till every uh, last question gets answered. But uh, we definitely uh, uh, appreciate the, the time that you're taking out of your day to spend spend with us. So for those folks, I think we've met most everybody up here and here. Um, mostly staff, faculty coming, or you want to share a little bit of what areas you're in? Uh, we'd we'd kind of like to know in case some of our examples drift your way. Faculty is here in Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> All right, we're asleep. Hi, I'm one of those uh, administrator types. So, uh, okay. Thanks for coming today and making it through the snow and cold. We yeah, appreciate. it was an interesting drive. I came from Minneapolis, so uh, I was a little bit behind that big pile up and had to divert around Ames. And then I got to Des Moines and I 80 was closed for, I think, the same type of reason coming west, so I had to wait that one out. But uh, no, happy to be here. Um, my name is Mark Schultz. I'm one of the sales executives for eThink. I shared with folks, uh, I have a background. I was a principal and uh, teacher in grades four through eight, five through eight in, uh, when I first uh, got out of college. I did some administrative software. I was with eCollege for a, an LMS for a while. Um, they did more work with some of the for-profit colleges. Uh, I was with D2L for a couple years, and uh, I've just ended up uh, very happy now supporting open source and uh, what open source is, is all about. So definitely, uh, uh, again, want to kick this off. So I wasn't going to backtrack track all the way. We did some things this morning where we talked about some of the uh, issues that have been identified here. Um, we are, as I mentioned, a Moodle partner. So we like to refer to ourselves as Moodle by eThink. Um, we are a support entity uh, designed to provide not only the hosting, but all of the support. We are about a, a team of about 25 strong. Uh, we have Moodle experts, we have integration experts, uh, but what we've built our reputation on is, is responsiveness and response times to the issues that, that you might have. And so really what we wanna talk about is what would life be like uh, at eThink as opposed to Moodle Rooms? Should it be decided that you would wanna continue 
with using Moodle, take advantage of everything you know, what are the types of things we do, and show you those differences um, as it relates to that. Uh, the people I've already talked to are probably sick of saying it, but you know, one of them is the testimony, and I don't want to beat it to a, a dead horse, but 60 of your fellow colleges have left Moodle rooms and come to eThink. So uh, we have had no client leave eThink and go to any other Moodle provider in 10 years. Um, so I, I put that out there for the sake of, of just saying that is uh, the track record. That is uh, kudos to the Courtney behind me and the support team that I get to stand in front of uh, as we talk about that. So we think there are some things that we can definitely improve upon, uh, make life easier, make life better. And uh, that's what we want to talk through um, as we start today. So if you want to go um, just to the next slide. All right, the way that we approach this, and, and again, as, as being a Moodle provider, we have that commitment back, but we're going to do the cloud hosting. Our cloud provider is Amazon Web Services, or what you see out there is AWS. That makes sure we give you a very reliable and scalable uh, system. We want to make sure that the, you know, the, I guess the door is always open and that the internet is always available. Uh, so our cloud hosting, we've got an amazing track record there. Our approach, I think, as, as far as our support, um, I would say is, is what we like to refer to as more of a fully managed. And so if there are, let's say you're moving into a new program or um, competency-based has come up today, we want to do some things that are more competency-based. How can we make sure the students are getting those check marks off for the showing mastery of those things? If you want to talk that through and see what we've seen and what we've set up, Courtney uh, has demonstrated some of that, we want to be able to set up uh, more consulting types. If, if you want to talk something through, we take that as more of a fully managed. Or if there's something, you know, maybe not as often, something that's not working. Uh, you've talked about some things not working like single sign-on currently and some of those types of things. We've got folks that make sure that that's happening. Or if a plugin's not working, we make sure that that is happening and continues to work. But it's more of a fully managed. And we'll talk about that response time because if you <laughs> If you are waiting for the answer to a response question, um, days is not really usually what you would like to wait. Um, those things are pending. They're causing issues for, for folks somewhere in the, in the college, and we want to make sure we can answer those. We don't take it, the second bullet there, we don't take it on ourselves um, as we're working with core Moodle. We try not to fork the core Moodle code. We do not want to create a situation where you have to rely on us. And at some point in time, if we fall on our face, you don't want to move away from us because we've got some custom code that is necessary for what you're doing. So we'll use, uh, I would say, I think there's 1300 some plugins out there. All of those are available. We'll, we make any plugins available, but we try not to fork core Moodle code. That takes you away from what open source is intended to do. The third bullet we've talked about uh, again earlier in the day, the third bullet is kind of a big one. Um, from what you currently have to what you think represents. Um, Moodle Rooms runs folks on a, um, a code base where everybody is really sharing the same code base. In the eThink environment, you would have your own separate code base. You would have Moodle as if you were running it yourself. So that, that creates some restrictions for you. There's a subset of plugins that are allowed in the Moodle Rooms environment and others are not because it's going to affect and impact other organizations. So we allow, as, as you'll see in the, the fourth bullet there, there's never any cost. Um, that is also a difference. If you tell us you want to use a plugin, we're not going to say get your checkbook out. We don't have to evaluate it. We don't charge for, for that. As, as I also mentioned earlier, if it's a bad plugin and we've had a bad experience in it, we'll tell you that. If you still want to use it, you know that's up to you if you would want to take advantage of that. But a separate code base means you can use any plugin that's out there. There's no restrictions as far as the plugin. 
It also means that upgrades take place on your timing. We don't tell you because it's your Moodle, it's sitting all there by itself in, in its own instance. You tell us when would be a good time to be the things have slowed down, it's the end of a term, you've got time to educate people as to what changes are going to be coming. Uh, but you tell us that. We don't give you a window and say, guess what? It's time to rock your world by, by putting in an upgrade in the middle of the semester or term or whatever that might, might be. So that, again, is a, a big difference in the way that we operate. We've also had conversations about things like uh, the, the fully integrated SIS. You're currently using something called the ILP. We are also an Aleutian Alliance partner, so we work very closely with the Aleutian product set, which includes Kali. We have our own integration. Uh, it does things like, uh, what did we say? It keeps uh, the enrollments of the students in real time. So anytime a change is made by the registrar, registrar it's instantly available and updated. Uh, so if the student walks out of the registrar's office, the change is made, they open up their mobile app, uh, it would be, available to them. Uh, one that we got a little bit of nodding on earlier was the unhiding of courses, uh, making them available. Uh, that's part of our integration where we could say two weeks before the term starts, or one, one week before the term starts, unhide all courses so that it's a consistent experience for the student. But um, we probably won't dive too much into the, the integration. We've kind of exhausted that with uh, some of the other folks, but it is an area um, that we have expertise. Um, Illusion is coming out with a brand new product, which some of your IT folks uh, I think are aware of, called Ethos, which is their next generation. Uh, and so as an Illusion partner, we're the only Moodle provider working with that, which will mean we'll, we'll be able to keep uh, Colleague and Moodle in sync. One more screen, and then I'm gonna give it over to Courtney. But this is kind of the how of what we get done. We do the cloud hosting. It's an unlimited support model. We will build any Moodle report that you want out of the system. Um, again, this is a, a difference. We use something called a configurable report writer. We know where all of the data is in Moodle because that's our job. And so if as an organization you say our faculty would need, would love this report, we will go ahead and build it, put it on a menu out there so you can run it, export it, whatever you would need to do. Um, that tool is not enabled uh, in, currently in your little rooms environment. So that would be something new um, that you would experience. And we've built a lot of reports for a lot of colleges. And so we can make, uh, you know, we're not gonna flood you necessarily with all of those reports. And, but if you wanted some of those, um, you could, have those, modify them, et cetera. We also put our training courses out there, which I think from a faculty perspective, um, you do have, uh, you offer some training here. Those are just designed to supplement your faculty training. But if, if you're trying to remember how to do something and you can't quite remember it, you don't do it all the time, um, there is a student orientation course that we keep current. It stays current with every version, so it's been upgraded to Moodle 3.4 now, which is the current version. There's a Moodle 101 for faculty, for building courses, knowing how to uh, uh, add activities, uh, everything to do with building a course. There's a Moodle 201, which is more for advanced function, including videos on how to do things, um, how to facilitate courses, and there's an admin course. So four courses, we put them on your site. You can uh, hide certain portions of them. You can add things that are specific to Southeast, uh, but you have those courses. We just upgrade, update them when new versions come out. So I get uh, all pretty fired up about support and the types of things that we do. The big numbers that you're seeing on the screen uh, are what we continue to monitor as an organization. Those are our response times. So in an average of 39 minutes, when um, a ticket is placed and somebody has a question whether a faculty member can't get a grade book uh, calculated right or there's an interest in a new plugin or whatever, it's 39 minutes, uh, according to our last six month audit, 39 minutes for us to be in contact human, human to human. 
and 58 minutes to resolve our support tickets. Um, so um, we set the bar, uh, I guess uh, I would say pretty high for the industry at that point in time. When you talk about the support tickets, do you have certain people within the support tickets or would all faculty have access to that support? How does that work? It can go both. Um, as far as what you think, um, what we agree with, um, as, as far as contract, I guess, with the dis with the college, it would be more of a <laughs> tier two support, and that's pretty common where faculty would funnel their questions and see if it's already been answered to an admin. We don't typically, I mean, some organizations are, uh, you know, say it's got to be one person, but you know, it can be a handful of people that can funnel that um, upward. But uh, it was interesting that, that you asked because, uh, again, if, if the question is coming forward um, and it just simply gets forwarded to us, that will be the response or, or what you can normally expect. Um, obviously, you know, a little bit of fluctuation if it's uh, peak time or anything like that. But on a, on a rule or as an average, those are going to be the, the kinds of responses that we have compared to, I think, some of our um, the other Moodle providers that, you know, was even mentioned here. It can sometimes be three, four days a week or, or whatever uh, to get a response back. Follow up question on that then. Do you also offer the opportunity or a program where we could yes. send all the faculty to the board? Yes, there is. We do have, we offer that through a, a it's a partner of eThinks. It's called eLearning Innovations, is that organization, and they would offer a 24 by 7 uh, around the clock end user, so faculty, student, whomever. It's e-learning innovations, and, and I can usually help put people in, in touch with that if you want. But um, straight through eThink, if it's funneled through, um, some colleges prefer just to say, okay, we want to we want to hear what are the issues in case it's something. If they hear it three or four times, maybe it's something that could be changed in order to accommodate that. Others, you know, want that immediate. The other thing that I just wanted to mention, and, and I, don't know, I don't exactly ever know how to bundle this up and, and share this with you, but I truly believe that when folks call in to eThink, they're talking to and they're having uh, conversations and they sometimes have a huge amount of appreciation that they share with us. So in internal at eThink, we have something that we call eThink Love. And so it's just... Uh, it keeps us reminded of exactly what we're doing and kind of why we do it. But these were the, we, we send this out weekly. And so these are quotes uh, that come in from people. And these were in our internal Friday email that went out. And these were the comments from last week that were just grabbed as, as people's comments. And, and I think to me that says a little bit of, of why We've been able to maintain a 99% client retention rate um, and why clients you know, know that if something can be, if there's a chance that it can be fixed and, and improved upon, uh, we'll try to find a way to do that. So it just gives you a flavor for, for what it's like to work with you think. So any questions on just that uh, short overview? We want to spend the, the majority of the time, the rest of the time having Courtney show you some details. Questions, comments? Okay, thanks. Now here's Thanks. All right. So, as Mark mentioned, I'm Courtney Bentley. I'm the um, VP of Services, so I oversee all of the support work that happens, whether that's on the technical side or um, you know, conversations about competency-based education or we run the gamut. Uh, what I wanted to do today was, you know, I obviously know that um, as an institution, you guys have been using Google for quite some time. Um, so what I wanted to do was just um, you know, bring to the surface a couple of things that some of our institutions have been using. Um, I want to you know, show you some of the client sites and some of the pieces that we do that's a little unique uh, around Moodle. 
Um, the first thing that you should know, um, I, I'll, I said I would do it in the first session and then we skipped around. Um, I'll go ahead and do an import of a course for you guys just so that you can see that. But the one thing that you should keep in mind is that because you are a rural institution, um, we would take your, your existing Moodle site and migrate it in full. So um, there would be no manual one-to-one -one types of conversions that would be necessary. Faculty would not need to um, download their backups and modify them in any way and bring them over. Um, all of that would be seamless to you. So you would see some downtime probably between terms. Um, and when you log back in, the site may look different. It would probably be upgraded. May have a new theme applied, but all of your courses um, would be there. Um, we also, as Mark mentioned, we do integration. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time there, but you know, as you currently have your course sites created for you each new term, um, that would still continue in, in one form or another. Um, I don't want to get into the details, um, you know, because you just need your course and you need your students in the courses and you need to be able to get to work and, and build those out. Um, part of the reason that we, um, we build new course sites um, for you each new term and part of our philosophy in allowing you to keep as many past um, semesters or terms in as you'd like is because that's going to give you flexibility to do imports from term to term. So you may have constructed some really nice modules in the past or you may have really settled on kind of a course format that you really like. Um, you may have worked with your um, instructional design team to get a course really set up uh, in, in a way that works well for you and for your students. And so we want you to be able to go in and grab those um, from term to term and pull them right in and then make any necessary changes. So um, making sure that you have that, that flexibility there. Um, <coughs> When I talk about theme, um, you know, that's another, another thing um, that, that sometimes trips people up. The theme is really just the layout and structure of the site, what it looks like. Um, it can modify, as, as you're probably aware, it can modify some of the functioning of employees, where things exist, um, how they interact. Um, all of the themes that we um, try to encourage our clients to use are responsive themes. So we want you and your students to have the best possible experience, regardless of the device they prefer. Um, you know, it, it baffles me um, how much work they tend to attempt to do and, I guess, accomplish on this. Um, and so we want to make sure that you know, if, if they are trying to do that, that they are as successful as they can be um, in that limitation. Um, so all themes are responsive themes. It's going to look just as well um, on the mobile device, although you know much smaller. Um, but they're going to have a good experience regardless. Um, I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, Moodle also um, has has been making available in the last couple versions a freely available Moodle mobile app. So the mobile app also allows you and your students to connect to your Moodle installation. And it pretty much acts like a reader for you. So you're able to then get at the same content. You're, you're able to um, you know, engage in messages, receive your notifications, um, participate in discussion forums. So it just gives you another opportunity, another option um, if you wish to, to take, it, take it onto your mobile device. And we do all the configuration behind the scenes to make sure that's working um, and, and gives you the ability to connect. Um, one of the interesting things as we get into course content, um, we've been doing quite a few um, sessions with different schools on um, universal design um, and design choices for your courses that are going to make your content work well across, again, devices and also uh, um, well, you know, as far as um, different people, different limitations that they may have as well. So making sure that content is going to be both accessible and universal for all of your students. <coughs> um, I think I'm going to backtrack. Um, uh, okay. um, so I logged in as a student. I just want to give you kind of an overview of the navigation and some of those key features. Probably a review for most of you because you've been using Moodle. Um, what you are looking at right now, this sort of popped out white 
kind of version is a user tour. I don't know if you're using any of these right now. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the user tour is a piece of functionality that's built right into Moodle. What it allows us to do is to build some custom walkthroughs. So if you're anything like me, every time you log into your insurance company or your bank, um, you've probably seen one of these here or there. So this allows us to customize what appears on the screens. Um, so it just gives them a custom walkthrough. Um, this has been really helpful, particularly um, as we've had uh, upgrades, so moving from version to version, to kind of highlight, point out some of those key features. Um, all of us are operating a very limited time, and so this just gives you the opportunity to highlight some of those. So you'll notice that this user tour is obviously on the front page of my Google site, so everyone who logs in the first time they see this, they're able to end the tour, make it go away, they don't have to endure it anymore. Um, these can also be put in uh, individual courses, so they could be put in at the course level. Um, we have a couple of institutions we've worked with to build these out for, um, they have some, uh, some guidelines on how to build out courses, kind of course expectations for what's so what needs to be in there for particular styles of courses. And so we've helped them to build user tours to kind of highlight those so it's really pretty obvious when you log into the course template the first time uh, about what needs to happen there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the tour here and just jump us back to the front page. Now, I mentioned I logged in just now as a student. Um, I'm using a, a theme um, that gives us a little flexibility, make it a little more um, colorful, interesting, we can add some other features um, to it. Um, but most of the same navigation is going to hold true. So up across the top, you know that this is where your, um, your dashboard lives, your profile, um, your grades overview, your messaging. They also pulled out the messaging and notifications pieces, um, uh, make them more visible. I understand that um, a lot of you are really encouraging your students to use Moodle as the vehicle for messaging so that they're not clogging up their email account that they may not check as frequently as you would like. Um, so the messaging components, bringing that to the forefront is really nice for them um, and for you. Um, also the notifications, so anytime uh, you, know, you have grade submissions or um, as you see here, as you submit assignments and things like that, from a student perspective, um, getting those notifications. Um, both of those pieces are also going to be in that mobile app. So again, making sure that they have easy access to those. Um, the slide navigation. So probably, I think in your latest version, you forgot to see this. So um, over on the left-hand column, giving you that slide navigation is where they uh, touch some of that navigation block content into the site. Um, many of our clients have, with the, the latest version, they've begun sending their um, users directly to the dashboard. So one of the, um, you know, one of the big, sort of big changes that the, um, the Google users organization uh, funded and sort of uh, wrangled was this reimagination of the course overview. Um, so this is hooking into the completion settings from within your course. So if you are setting up criteria so that it marks completion for your students, it's keeping track of that for them so they see their progress um, as they're working through those courses. I personally prefer the timeline view. I think it, for me and the way I work, the timeline view is much more um, sort of helpful uh, because the timeline view is basically showing me a sort by date across all of my courses <coughs> um, as things are coming due. So um, this also includes um, uh, grade by dates. So if you, um, when you set up your assignments, you can indicate for yourself kind of a grade by uh, date. And so that will also filter here into the course overview. Um, the really the thing that I really like about this, in addition to it obviously helping me to prioritize my time a little bit, um, also gives me that quick access to get right in to begin the lesson or submit the assignment or um, whatever the, uh, the 
thing is that I need to be accomplishing. So um, what I jumped into now is just a lesson. Let's see. Um, let me let me go ahead and um, maybe drill into a course. Uh, let's see. Go to my biology course here. I just want to show you a, a, a submission from a student perspective. I know that you, know, you probably see this all the time, um, but we'll, we'll look at it there on the instructor perspective as well. Um, let me jump down to the slide. I've already submitted it. But if I want to edit my submission and add something new here, And as you know, students have that same um, drag and drop interface as we have. So, allowing you to, to drag and drop files onto that interface. So, now I've added that, uh, that piece to my submission. So, much I'll add, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, before I leave out of here, uh, out of this course and move on, I did just want to bring these up. Mark mentioned our training resources. Um, this is a piece that uh, we really take a lot of pride in. We know that obviously time is limited, and so we want to make sure that you have access to good Google resources um, should you want to use them. So um, when we talk about our integration, one thing that we uh, do a lot for our institutions is we will go ahead and add all first-year students into the student orientation <coughs> for example so that they have immediate access the first time they log in they see the orientation they're able to go in um, and really just practice with some of these activities and resources um, you by no means have to use these as is you're welcome to uh, to modify them uh, deconstruct them um, I think uh, uh, was it Brandon earlier asked the question about if they were customized to your institution? They're not. They're more generic on the tools and how to use them. Um, but you are always welcome to go in and customize these further. We don't control the copyright on them or anything like that. We uh, make them available for you to do to customize. Um, yeah, certainly. So we're in the um, we're in the 101, which is the um, introductory skills. So this one is more about building your course out. Um, so off this way first, so you can see. So it's about course structure and setting and um, building and editing the course and the different types of activities and resources. Um, information about mobile and how to optimize for that. Um, so this one's really around more of the setup of things. Um, and then the 201 is really about teaching in them. So how do I respond to forums? How do I grade? How do I label the grade book? Um, what do all these settings mean? Kind of in, in that vein. And then the last one is an administrator training. So um, those of you who will be uh, having oversight in the, the system, we make that available so that you have some additional resources to, to refer to as well. Um, all of these do use, let me just jump to a step here. So all of these do use the mobile tools um, so that you have experience in seeing what those tools are like from a student perspective. Um, and we do, as you see over here with the completion tracking, um, we do indicate completion tracking for these courses. And we do issue, we have them set up so that they'll issue a badge upon successful completion. So, um, some institutions build that into their, um, their faculty training, particularly for online or hybrid types of courses. Um, so again, just another sort of benefit um, to what we provide here. Um, we also do a lot of, um, our services team does a lot of like, what's new type of webinars and things like that that our clients are always um, invited to, to come and attend and get the new, the new features. Let me, uh, let me look at a couple of client sites just to 
kind of give you some other perspective. Um, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into your sandbox and <coughs> do a little thing. So I mentioned the different themes, uh, different approaches. Um, we've already mentioned on the technical side that one of the things we would definitely set up initially is uh, integration with your ADFS so that you have to log in um, separately to all of those accounts you can put together. Um, some of our organizations have a lot of uh, information available prior to login. Um, others have everything hidden. Um, again, you and your team are going to be able to, you know, uh, decide what what appears to um, students and faculty. Um, what's most important to you? How do you want the, um, the system configured? Um, we obviously make recommendations all the time and um, can point you in some good directions. Um, but ultimately, it's it's your Google site. It's your learning management system. It needs to fit your needs. Um, so on the on the other hand, so the last one you saw, lots of images, lots of graphics, lots of bells and whistles. This one, um, much more streamlined, much more clean. Um, these guys are um, they have some integrations with some of their uh, their resources. I know you guys, uh, some of you mentioned um, different textbook publishers and, and that type of content. They've got a lot of that integrated in here as well. Um, but again, very clean site just back to the functionality, really the focus is just on um, the courses and the course content. They're not trying to make this a uh, portal per se. Um, let's see. This one, this institution is uh, integrated with Google. That's why you see the login with Google. Um, most of the time they don't even see that because it just passes them right through. Um, this client's been using Google for quite some time, and one of the things that they uh, have on their front page are some, um, and you'll notice they use both the advanced forum and the regular forums, so they, they have options there. Um, but they have some support forums available for their, um, for their campuses. So uh, they use the Google tools right there on the front page to let people ask questions and troubleshoot and talk through ideas. So again, really letting the, the institutions drive the content, drive the capabilities, um, and what's there. Um, and again, just another client site, just a different look, a different approach. Um, I, I pulled this institution earlier because we were talking about um, you know, dispersed campuses, having multiple campuses that you um, obviously, you're managing as a single college, and so we had talked a little bit about that. They um, they have students who are taking uh, classes on a range of campuses as well, um, in addition to some online and some accelerated uh, weekend types of programs, things like that. Um, and I pulled this one up. This is just uh, another example of ADFS um, passes them over if they're not authenticated and gets them locked in. So, um, just wanted to have some examples there of those. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. And using that Fortson theme that you saw earlier for my um, my learner who was logged in into my site, um, we did a really quick Spartan kind of stand up for you guys so that at least it would be your your stuff and look at least a little familiar to you. Um, we put in those Google training courses, so you guys that have access here can take a look at those. Um, I just wanted to kind of show, again, some of that, that customization and kind of what we can do in terms of layout. Uh, I'm going to go ahead into the courses. I know that one of the, um, one of the things that we wanted to do, um, actually, I'll uh, just store a course more, more simplistic than that. Um, so I already mentioned that, you know, if, if you stick with Moodle, one benefit here is that um, you're not going to have to go back in and reconstruct um, your courses and your content. Anybody have a preference? Does this belong to anybody in the room? Yeah, co-parenting. 
All right. So again, um, we would bring over all of these courses. You wouldn't have to do this as a one-to-one -one restore. Um, you wouldn't have to, uh, to do this. But if you had local copies of your content that you wanted to pull in, you're obviously uh, always welcome to do that. I'm not pulling over any of your users or any of that. Just pulling in the course content itself. So we'll let that run. Um, <coughs> any questions so far? So here's your course, um, right back in. So there's your advanced forum. Notice it pulled over to there. Um, how many of you use the access restrictions when you're setting up your course? Anybody using access restrictions? Yeah. Are you um, are you restricting for or against? Are you are you making content available after they do something, or are you taking content back? Oh, okay. I'm restricting until I consider a date. Okay. So mostly, mostly the date restriction. Okay. Anybody I'm else? Group restriction. Group, yeah. Group's a good one as well. Yeah. The um, we talked a little bit earlier about access restrictions and kind of the power there. One of the um, we have to write these blog posts. And so one of the ones that I wrote recently was about using the access restrictions to provide supplemental content to your students. So um, if you're based on a score that wasn't as high as you expected, um, then giving them additional content or additional assignments to work through kind of those pieces. Um, you know, I, don't, I don't know that we uh, specifically, we're gonna talk about it, but I don't know any student services um, so one of the other things are, are you guys using the, um, the ability to grant additional time or do quiz override kind of capabilities? Okay, that's another one that's obviously huge that we see. Um, there was a, there, we've, we've been looking at this um, recently because there were some issues with being able to do those overrides if the quiz wasn't available already. Um, and so that's just one of the things that we've just been working through to make sure that that looks fixed as well. Because that's such an important, it's such an important piece to what you do. Um, and you know, being able to give students additional opportunities or give them additional time. Um, are you really releasing content additional content that hasn't been Different strategy. So we're using the, the access restrictions within the course itself um, to manage that. Do you have the first one for you? Not. We talked a little bit about some of the use cases there and, and how we might be able to accommodate those. Um, there's also a plugin that was just released, thinking about the PLD and the, the release of content. Um, there's a plugin that was just released last, late last week that allows us to hook courses together. Um, it's not as useful probably in the, the higher ed kind of sense, because most of that's driven from your SIS with set prereqs and those types of pieces. But what this will allow you to do is within Moodle, hook some of those courses together um, to manage enrollment into the next course. Um, so as you're thinking about the competency base, so I know the competency based stuff is something you're thinking about and looking at, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to really make sure that plugin is solid, because we see that as another uh, potential benefit to the competency base stuff. So you have a series of modules within a course, those modules get released over time to them as they accomplish and work through. And then once they complete the first set, it pushes their enrollment into the next one to build on those competencies. So some of those pieces, making sure they're, they're in place and ready for some of those strategies. Um, what else would you like to see in a course? I know we, we did the course restore here um, you guys using a lot of quizzes? Yeah. 
So I mentioned the mobile app, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, I will show that to you as well. Um, one of the things that has also been added along with the quiz um, and the mobile app is those access restrictions, the ability to say whether or not you'll allow students to take it on their mobile device or not. So being able to add in that restriction if you want to. Um, let me go ahead and pull this up. And, uh, oh, that's going to... Sure? Yep. Let me see if I sound off chance I will connect. Um, in terms of quiz development, are you creating your own question banks? Are you pulling in quiz question banks? Or Sometimes. It's coming out of me. Respondents. Oh, okay. So you guys are using responders as well? Perfect. Are you using um, just the respondus portion to bring over the quiz questions or are you using lockdown browser as well? Both. Okay, great. Okay. Um, that's another thing, just we talked about integrations and, and I've been kind of jotting these down. Um, for those of you who are teaching day to day, may not mean a whole lot to you. Those of you who are supporting those pieces that you um, appreciate and, and need, um, I just wanted to mention that one of the things that we do, you know, we say we'll install any third party plugin, get it set up, and working with you. Um, what we also mean by that is if it's not working, we will get on the phone with you and that company and work through those issues. So, for example, we spend a lot of time on the phone with our friends at Pearson. There are issues with the integration there. We've, you know, we're partners with Kaltura. We talk to them all the time if there are hiccups or issues or things that need to be addressed and fix up. So I just want to throw that in there um, is that when we say that, we really mean that. It's not a, oh, well, I don't know. It's on those guys. It's not working. It must be them. Um, so the respondents one reminds me of it because we were seeing some issues, and so I know that they were setting up a call to, to work with us. Yeah, question. Can you show the question types? Yeah. So let me. Um, are there um, are there additional question types that uh, that you guys have been using or have been wanting to use? Um, we have a lot of this question types, so we have like the drag and drop um, markers, drag and drop markers. Yep. So this, um, this site is, uh, your demo site is just very core. I didn't add any extras in here, so all of the ones you see are just standard question types. Um, so, uh, drag and drop onto image, drag and drop markers, um, the calculating question types, these are all the basic ones. We do have a lot of others installed in other client sites. So we can take a look at those. Um, a lot of times you'll come over having used some that you don't even know are additions, and so we just get those added so that all those questions are still there. Yeah. Yeah, so depending on which question type you want to use, um, you know, one of the one of the ones that gets used quite often for those types of things is like a drag and drop onto images or a drag and drop markers where you're giving them the options and having them indicate the locations on them. Um, so you basically are able to add drop zones onto here. 
I always hate doing this like live. It always makes me like, oh, I want to go back to my office and do this. Um, let me see if I can find it. I have a lot of question example types too that I can pull up and show you so you can see them in action if you have it. And so background image where you can pull over an image that you wanted to use. I say that it has to be like here. And then I would use those two more hits here. Set it up. <coughs> so it's always giving you those tool tips as well for how you want to, um, for any of the things that you're looking at. So I'll show you some examples of questions. We also have been doing a lot with incorporating video and audio into question types. I know do you guys use Kaltura. Are you using any of those the, um, the pieces for the uh, text editor? We're using you mean your HTML editor? That's the Kaltura button. Okay. Okay. So you are using. Some of the foreign language classes use audio and language issues. I just thought we'd pull up examples of question types. Here's an example of what's been doing, and I'll pull up when we get to a drag and drop one. I'll show you. I think it's easier to see it when it's mapped in. So this one is just an example of using some of the audio, video, right into the question types, so giving them something to watch or something, and asking them questions about things. We get into this one that has all of the question types that are for. So this is the one that I'm just working through in terms of adding coordinates in those pieces of data. Or to know the boundary lines for where you'll accept the answers. Other questions about quizzes or, <clears throat> or other specific activity types? Um, that's another thing just to notice, um, turn that in on here. Um, again, you know, your sandbox site is pretty basic. We didn't add a whole lot of extras in here. Um, but that is the thing to keep in mind is that this activities list will be based on your institution that you've been through. So this is where you'll find um, you know, Kaltura assignment type, Kaltura resource types, uh, turn it in, any of those other pieces will just be part of the activities list here and the resources. I will say this theme, and I don't think I pointed this out to this group, I mentioned it earlier. Um, 
One of the things that people like about this theme, the reason why some of our institutions have decided to use it, is it does add another kind of so you probably all have begun to become acclimated to this gear icon, or that's where all your sort of options live. Um, this theme actually built a, a course management panel. So there's a version of this for the teacher, and there's also a ver version of this for the student. Um, so the teacher's version here has um, kind of blown out, if you will, the settings from that dropdown so that they're all a little bit more accessible. But again, you know, that can be turned on or off based on the you know, institution's preference and when you use it or not. Um, I think what you're probably, you may or may not be tired of hearing me say this, but that's really a big part of what we provide is that flexibility um, to be able to be more specific. It's not giving you a closed box and saying, good luck, this is the way it is. Just want to make sure that it fits your there. Yeah. Do you have any institutions that use the snap theme? We do not. Um, Moodleworms does make the snap theme available, but we have decided it's, it's really more than a theme, and so we've decided that we don't install it. If we wanted it, and we still have it, like you had said that we have plugins that you, if there's problems with it, you will help people, but you don't stop them from those, there's no way if we want to do that, we would have this down. We would definitely have to take it up with someone above me. <laughs> it, um, it does a complete change of the, the whole interface. It's not just a theme sort of thing. It actually does kind of take over more than that. So. That's part of our hesitation with it. Your updates, then, are, like your, are you doing the same kind of updates with like Four uh, Moodle does and that Google Roots does? I mean, there, I, it's not an update based on who's offering it, like the three point five the update we did in December. That's something that came on our Four Moodle, right? Right. The, two, the two main Google updates a year. Those are coming from four Google, correct? They're right. not coming from like a company. Yes. And then other companies are not customizing those. Those are coming straight out of four Google. That's correct. Correct. So, like, the problems we have with the update came out of four Google, not Google or how do you think? I mean, the problems you're having, the problems Google Worms is having. Is because of dealing with the core of the product that the update was. Except in the case where they made like a, a theme like Snap is because it's not simply a theme, it's actually it needs to integrate to that. And so that's why in that opening slide, we think as a rule tries to not make an update that's going to be more than that, where Boost and Fordson are more themes that are just designed to change that look and feel, where Snap goes in and actually it is more than a theme, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to address it. So we try to avoid that for the reason, again, that if, if somebody gets accustomed to that and it takes you away from a little bit more core Moodle, people tend to stay away from that. Not that we can't have a conversation, but it, it will be at a level, you know, as to what is the impact of doing that. Not necessarily in the past, we've tried to hear away. So back to your question about the updates. So Google Core releases updates twice annually, a big release. They do point releases between there. Um, and then obviously your the plugins and those pieces. So that's why you guys just moved to 3.3 recently, right? December probably is when they did their big push. Um, we already have people who are lined up to go to 3.4. Um, we've got a couple of people on 3.4 now um, because of some of the things that they needed, but um, part of it is waiting on the plugins. So that's why you also see, if you watch Google Core's release and Google Room's release, definitely, um, a big time difference, and that's because they need to update all of their plugins and specific pieces to be able to work with the functionality. Two questions. Yeah. 
and going back to activities a little bit. Okay. Is there a way to um, for me to just get rid of the thing form or hide it or something? Because we would want the like advanced form or the norms form that we currently use now. The majority of our instructors use now. Um, the plain form doesn't have the nicer grading options that it used to. And it causes confusion how to vote. Would there be a way to get rid of it or so that people can't see the plain form? I try to remember, I think that you can't completely disable it because there's some other pieces of functionality that rely on it. Um, one of the things that you could do if you went with like the boards in theme, one of the things you can do is customize what shows up in the activity list. So you could leave it turned on, but essentially it would not be available to the majority of people. And then my other question was, um, do you have, like right now we have a dates for quarters and the instructors can at least go like on one page and see all the dates for all of the assignments for all the quizzes. Um, do you have that feature? And then um, do you have, or do you have any plans to have like a date rollover kind of thing? Like where if the start date of this course was set, on this date, the dates are set in the course. When you copy it into the new course, it kind of takes the start date of that date, rolls the date figures them out automatically. Uh, Is it that move core headquarters was talking? About? Yeah, I think core may have added that, can, or at least it's on the thing. Yeah, Mark, Mark did not go too far uh, to look. Um, date seed date or date report, yes, uh, we've got a lot of clients using that. Um, the rolling option, depending on how you import the course, um, can roll the date and then it will adjust. And then um, I admittedly have not been in 3-4 doing a whole lot of the testing and work, but one of the other things you can now do is just drag and drop to change the due dates. So if you're looking at the calendar for the course, this is on due on Tuesday and you need to move it to the following Thursday, you can just pick it up in the calendar and drag it and drop it and then we'll adjust those dates. So I know that there have been things that touch on that, uh, those aspects. Other questions? Let's say health sciences wants to use the foursome theme and math wants to use the boost theme. Is that doable? Is it doable? Yes. Is it preferred? No, not really. We just feel like that it makes uh, a significant transition for the users um, going between courses. And so um, whenever possible, try to do a site-wide theme um, and then within the course construct um, you know we, you can do different course formats you can pull in different like, initial theme or not initial theme initial um, like template course those types of things those things have been for most of our so, um, that type of customization it's just difficult for a student when they log in and the navigation in some of their courses is so clear and then they switch to a different course and it's like to here and it's colors and um, it's kind of a support nightmare um, and just difficult for the student. Just thinking back on that, I think we would want like all the courses to use the same overall theme, but a lot of instructors have expressed um, or programs have expressed like um, desire to have kind of their own like, program look or something. So is there a way to use the same theme that have like different color scheme for program or something if they want to have the, have the program level or a little bit of color customization or anything? Because right now that's one thing that we get complaints about is just that uh, not necessarily having the same theme for everything, but just having 
to have the same color, like for everything, and it's it's just all exactly the same. But I think people are looking just more for like color differences, yeah. more than like a totally different feeling. Like one of the um, one of the other approaches uh, with this theme that some of our institutions picked this because they really love was. Sam's background image is different from looking out from back here. Yeah, I think um, that's more of a faculty can control, you can set that so the faculty can control that on their own course. So each course can have its own sort of background graphic back here. Um, so it gives them kind of the <coughs> ability to create some sort of customization, some sort of visual indicator um, from course to course, even with, with, within the confines of the the same thing here. I'll jump into another course just to get that. So if you look at, um, and this one even uses kind of this, this other layout, so instead of just being the course, the text of the course names, um, this one's actually using that graphic as a thumbnail. I don't want to bore you guys, but we've also been working with the, there's a UX UI designer um, from Google Headquarters, been on their staff for nine months to a year now, um, and he's been working on a lot of prototypes for 35, um, and we've been doing a lot of work back and forth with them to give feedback and look at those, and that's, that's one part to the UI that we've been trying to push on. This, Ability to kind of individualize the courses within a framework. Other comments, questions for us? This may be kind of a lot of minutes later, but we've seen also some what was that now we can use this tool as an intentional learner or a direct book from the students being closely involved in my. So a lot of our institutions use other tools that are already doing that, and so we've integrated it in. So whether it's like you guys right now are using Nile Peak for some of that retention data, um, we've got institutions using things like Starfish and other retention models. Um, we mentioned learning record stores. We've got some people who are starting to dabble in that. Um, in terms of Google Core itself, um, there's not a whole lot in terms of that retention um, aspect. We do have uh, clients that we built custom reports for um, so that they are able to add a snapshot, kind of see what's the activity um, looking like for students. And you know, sometimes the report has the green, bold, red in there um, to flag those. Um, but it's still kind of a manual tool. Um, we do, we have some clients who also have been using the re-engagement plugin um, to do some of those alert notifications. And kind of, most of the time they use them to get the student back re-engaged, um, but I think we talked a little bit about having that go to a, someone else for that piece as well. You mentioned working with Pearson, what is your need? Well, 
But anyway, uh, again, we thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we we like to look at this as to say, can we help uh, you know take and build upon what you already know? Uh, you obviously have a, a pretty high skill level already. Um, you know, by the questions you're asking in detail, and instead of kind of uh, restarting that process, uh, our approach is to refresh and, and to say, let's take that to to the next level. We think uh, the system is as flexible as it can be. Obviously, the, the cost uh, certainly uh, comes into the discussion because with Moodle, you're not paying for the software itself and um, all the discussions around that. But from a feature set, uh, we hope that we were able to accomplish that, uh, at least display some of that expertise uh, we'll get back to you on some of the things that we uh, were kind of throwing around in our heads, or sometimes we just need to put our brain, our party brain around it um, a little bit more and, and get back to you on that. But um, I've got uh, cards. You can run the questions through Stephanie, or if you want to ask or hear me anything, uh, certainly there to do that. But, um, you know, if it's a decision to stay with Moodle and um, we can have the opportunity to, to work with you. Um, obviously, we would love that and uh, um, would work towards that goal. Thanks, everybody.